C. I think we need to focus on three things to prepare ourselves for a long term, and I emphasize long term, human exploration of Mars. I think we need to uh, focus the Mars robotic program on sample return, number one. Number two, I think we need to sail into the deep water, so to speak, get out of the Earth's moon system. And I think the first way to do that is to go to a near-Earth object asteroid. And I do think we need to establish a permanent research base on the moon. And I emphasize permanent there. Uh, so this is the goal, to establish a base on Mars, not to go to Mars, but to stay on Mars. And that's a key point I'll come back to. A long-term research goal based on Mars. Check, check. Yep. Okay, great. Carry this. Uh, can I carry it in my pocket? Uh, why, let me just quickly remind you why Mars, as we heard from the previous speakers, it's the question of life, life in the past. Did Mars have life? Was it a second genesis? Life in the present? Can Mars support life? Is it a place where humans can live and work? These are all questions, by the way. We don't know the answers to these questions. And future, can Mars have a biological future? These are the questions that drive Mars exploration, robotic and human. Uh, why Mars? Why are we asking these questions of Mars? Very quickly, because evidence that Mars had water, the presence of an atmosphere with carbon and nitrogen in it, and the good potential for preservation of evidence of past life in the cold, dry conditions on Mars. Uh, as we've heard before, there's water on Mars. Mariner 9 discovered water, and it's been rediscovered by every other mission since then. Uh, but there's ample evidence. You see the ice from Phoenix, uh, this, the MER images, and so on. There was water on Mars on the surface, and that's the fundamental reason why it's interesting. Our goal is to establish a research base. And as I'll argue many, many times this morning, it's to uh, establish a research base that operates for a long time. For me, a long time is 50. A long time is 50. Right? Uh, used to be four years was a long time. Uh, as you get older, what's a long time gets bigger and bigger. Pretty soon it'll be 200 years for me. Uh, what do we need to do before we can establish a 50 plus research base on Mars? Again, this is those same three points. We need to integrate the Mars program with human exploration. Right now, NASA has two Mars programs. One, in ESMD and one in SMD, to use the NASA jargon. Uh, sample return is the key mission that connects the robotic and the human exploration. And I'll come to that in a second. We need to fly beyond the moon. Going to the moon is relatively easy. Uh, you never really leave the gravitational system of the Earth-Moon system. You come back pretty easily. We need to learn how to fly beyond that. And, uh, an Apollo 8-like mission to an NEO or to Phobos is the key there. And I think we need to build a permanent base on the moon. I'll go to each of these in turn. First, let me remind you, we have two Mars programs, and I think our key goal for the immediate future is to push for the unification of those two programs. This is what I call NASA's Mars Program 1, human exploration of the moon and Mars. NASA's Mars Program 2 is the robotic exploration of Mars. And these two programs go to great pains to distance themselves from each other. You'd think that they were being operated by different, not just countries, different planets. Um, and there's really no reason for that. And we're, it's a good time to force a coherence now because the Mars science program is at a crossroads, uh, partly uh, precipitated by the uh, cost overruns and schedule overruns of MSL, but a variety of other things as well. I'm not going to go through them to detail. The bottom line is that the rationale for Mars having a separate program has to change. For the last 10 years, it has been the search for life. Mars was a special target because it was the only place we could go to to search for evidence of life. That is no longer the case. Now there's other targets, Enceladus, Europa, and Titan, that compete, and one would even say excel with respect to Mars in terms of the search for life. What's special about Mars now and why Mars deserves to still have a special robotic program is not the search for life. It's the fact that it's a potential future site for human exploration. And the Mars program, in a sense, realizes this. They've run out of the political capital associated with the search for life, in my opinion. And uh, it's a 
MSL is going to test that to its breaking point. Um, okay. Sample return is where the Mars program it realizes it needs to go to, and it's a good mission to connect human and robotic exploration. Uh, the, the first sample return could be a very simple mission. It lands, scoops up some dirt, puts it in a rocket, sends it back to Earth. But ultimately, we need to use the same approaches to do sample return that we will use to send humans. So the sample returns will be our first round trips to Mars. They will, that's an important concept. Humans, our robotic missions to Mars to date have been one-way trips. Uh, I know the next speaker will talk about humans on one-way trips, but at least NASA's official approach is humans are going to do round trips. Uh, sample return will be our first round trips. We might as well use that technology that we're going to develop for humans to do sample returns. So there's been a study looking at how we could use the same rockets and vehicles uh, to drive sample return. So there, uh, to look at doing a large mass at Mars, uh, landing vehicles to do multiple sample returns to Earth using the Ares 5 launch vehicle. And I'll just quickly show you some of the highlights of that. Uh, you can pack a lot of mass into an Ares 5, send it to Mars. You can do a sample return in a single uh, mission. And the sample return is key because it's the logical intersection between the two Mars programs. And I, I think that uh, we should focus on that within the Mars community, push hard for sample return. Why? First, it's got enormous scientific value. As Paul just said a few minutes ago, the level of analysis we can do here on Earth with return samples is enormous compared to what we can do in situ. Uh, it's directly relevant for scientific preparation for human exploration. If we're going to land uh, on a place on Mars and build a base, it would be nice to have a sample of the dirt in advance so we don't have the sort of surprises we had with Phoenix, as you saw in the earlier talk, where the dirt didn't behave the way we think proper dirt should behave. Right? So you go to Mars with all this equipment to move the dirt, the dirt doesn't do what you want it to do, you're in trouble. So you, it's almost a operational requirement to get a sample return from the site where you're going to put the base, as well as the safety, as well as the safety rate, for example. Big surprise from Viking, as you heard about. Well, perchlorate on Mars is at 1%. Just to put that in context, uh, DOD sites, uh, if the perchlorate in the groundwater is above 26 parts per billion, it becomes a cleanup site. Well, 1% is larger than 26 parts per billion. Even I can do that math, right? <laughs> well, what are the implications of that? And what else, what other surprises are in the chemistry of the soil? So we, a sample return is going to be driven by scientific site selection and safety requirements for human base. And of course, it's testing technology. Like I said, it's the, it's the return. We've got to ascent stages on Mars. We've got to have large aeroshells. Uh, entry systems and so on, uh, we might as well test them out on a sample return. Uh, the next key part I think we need to focus on is getting human exploration out beyond the moon. Uh, and the, the natural target for that are near-Earth objects where we can do small missions that get us out beyond the moon, get us out into deep space, into deep water, uh, without waiting for the development of significant hardware that would be required if we made that uh, a mission, say, directly to Mars. Here, for example, is a 150-day mission to a small object that was part of, again, a constellation-supported study looking at using constellation hardware for near-Earth object uh, missions. Here's a table of possible targets put together by Mal LeCompte and Tom Meyer. Possible targets, when you could go there, how long the missions would be. These are fairly short missions. They don't tax our capability to do life support. They don't tax the technology development. You don't need to develop a lander in our sense stage. These are not landing missions. There's really docking missions. Here's a picture of the Orion CEV uh, to scale with uh, a, a typical target object on this list. Right? And these are missions that also resonate with the public. Uh, I get a lot of calls, sometimes from my family, saying, well, what are you doing to save the Earth from killer asteroids? Uh, I say, well, I just got up a few minutes ago. <laughs> I'll get right on it, right? Uh, 
it's very easy to explain to people that NASA needs to be able to demonstrate the capability to go visit near-Earth objects. Not that any of them is on its way to a 